is in committee meeting of Thursday 21st of March 2019. It's gone 10.30 in with quorum. Can everyone remember in the public gallery and elected members to either switch off your telephones or, or place them on silent, please? Uh, Lucy, can we have said there an apologies, please? Good morning, everyone. I have 18 members present. We are quoted. And so far, I have received an apology from Councillor Fairbairn. Councillor Drybra is not present, but maybe a long later in the meeting. apologies in. Put Councillor Drybra's apologies in. I'll note those. Thank you. That's uh, Lucy, thank you. I uh, can also remind members that... Uh, the proceedings today will be recorded and might be made available later for, for public listening. Members, do we have any declarations of interest today? Jim McComb, then Dougie Campbell, and then a, a Colleen Jamie. Thank Jim McComb first. Thank you, Chair. A, item 6, 37 John Street, Whithorn. I am a member of the Whithorn Trust one of the objectors to the application, so I will not take any part in the discussion and will remove myself from the room. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Duke Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Item 4, Chair, uh, as you'll recall, I made a declaration of interest in relation to this item um, when this application was before the, the last committee. I'm aware that um, information has been received by the Council in relation to the applicant and my previous declaration of interest, and therefore I'm going to withdraw for this item. Thank you, Dougie. Pauline? Ah, oh, pardon. Sorry, can I say? I'm really getting good at this. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I declared an interest at the last meeting on item number four, and I left the room, so I'll be doing that again, if that's okay, as I do know the applicant. Um, with regards to item number five, I have met Mr. Rohn on a couple of occasions, but I do not have a close acquaintance with him. I know his daughter through business purposes, but again, only once or twice. So I will be staying in the room and, and participating if that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. David? Um, thank you, Chair. Item five, I know um, too many people might be indirectly affected by the, the outcome on number five, so I won't be sitting in there. And just to give you a heads up, I, I unfortunately have another engagement today and I won't be able to stay. So depending on how time frame goes, that might be the end of me. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, David. Uh, Ian Blake? Thank you. It's not so much a declaration of interest. It's number four. I wasn't at the last meeting, and it's just to explain that although I wouldn't take part in it, I'll remain because it will take too long for me to get back out and back in again. That's fine, Ian. Thank you for that. Uh, Ian Crother. Uh, I did declare interest in item four last, last time, so I, we're still in session, but I think it's maybe appropriate that I do continue that. But, I mean, I've had, had, as far as I'm aware, I've, I've certainly not read any further information that Councillor Campbell was referring to, so I'm not aware of that. So I've maybe, maybe even received it, but I haven't read it. I've not seen it. That's okay. No, no. It's your own personal declaration at this moment in time, and you have an interest, but you've got to remain. Is that right? Exactly the same as last time, that's correct, yep. I just that I spoke to him, he phoned me and that was it, so. Thanks for that, Ian, okay. If that's all declarations of interest, thanks for that, members, Lucy's noted then. Uh, we come to agenda item three, minute of the previous meeting of 21st of February 2019 for approval. Is this a true record, members, and we prepared to approve that? Okay, thank you very much. In that case, we come to agenda item number four. It's a continuation following a deferral for a site. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, thank goodness Lucy's here. Lucy will uh, uh, take us through the procedure for today, and this is both for uh, public speaking and for elected members. So, Lucy, just when you're ready, take us through the procedures for today, please. The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn, as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. 
The chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make the representation presentation after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application. Third parties supporting an application. Statutory consultees objecting to an application. Elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee. Such members should withdraw from the committee chamber after making their presentation. Applicants or their agents. Representers have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Presentations will be strictly <coughs> limited to three minutes per person, excepting for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. Representers should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members will have already read the report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or, for appropriate, agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. Thank you, Lucy, and thanks for that timely reminder again. OK, members, we come to agenda item number four. Land at Mark, Far Mark Farm, Glen Gap. Twynham, planning application for erection of dwelling house. This application will be continued following deferral for a site visit. <coughs> Lucy, can you remind members who is able to participate in the decision making today, please? The members who can participate today and who are present are as follows. Councillor Dempster, Councillor John Campbell, Councillor Dookie Campbell, however, he has declared an interest. Councillor Crothers, Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Duesty, Councillor Lever, Councillor Martin, Councillor McComb, Councillor McKee, Councillor Murray, Councillor Tate, and Councillor Young. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, David Sutty will take us through the slides just to remind us of the planning application and then we'll go straight into session. Oh, and I, I should remind members that Councillor Blake a, a, is remaining, but he will not participate in the decision-making process and I'm Councilor sure members Hesselop are content. Well. Pardon? And Councillor Hussop's doing the same. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, the site visit took place on Tuesday. Uh, and I apologise for not being able to organise better weather for the day. It wasn't the best. So location plan, you're basically in the Glen Gap area to the north of Twynham. And you've got an existing group of um, buildings which we have as officers accepted that this cluster here is now known as Mark Farm Steading, small building group. The application site is this red line here, lying to the west of the, the group. And the block plan gives a bit more detail. It is purely an application for planning principles, so the layout you see there is entirely indicative. It's it's not the the final layout at all. Um, I've had a look at this. The from what I can scale off the the boundary from here along there is 32 meters, and then in total from the edge of Mark Cottage down here up to the edge of the application site there. I make to be 67 metres. And then the photos, this is the, the site uh, entrance from the, the main road. You'll remember that there's a, a bit of a slope up towards the uh, small building group at the top. And you can't see it, but just on the left-hand side there is Mark Cottage. This is up at the small building group with Mark Farm. 
barn house and buyer cottage. And that uh, across the road is um, the mark, which is there. The next photo makes that a little bit clearer that the, the public road, which we sort of met on, um, the, the, oops, sorry, the, the mark is the, the property you can see there on the other side of the road. But as officers, we consider there is a cluster of uh, a grouping of buildings here, which meets the test of being a small building group. This is the application site. What the photo probably doesn't show particularly well that was more obvious on the site is that that is a very clear break in topography where it drops down. And what we also saw certainly on Tuesday was uh, an area of water sitting in here. And that uh, gives a, a view of the distance between where the, the entrance to the existing grouping is uh, for just the, the vehicular access as opposed to perhaps the, the actual buildings themselves and the distance down uh, to the, the boundary of Mark Cottage, which as I say, I, I made out to be about 67 metres. And that's looking down the hill towards Mark Cottage, so you get a, a flavour of the, the distance involved between that outlier building and the rest of the small building group. And that was just uh, an extract which we had last time for from the small building group uh, examples in the Housing in the Countryside Supplementary Guidance, which is, forms part of the development plan. So in summary, we, as officers, we've had a look at this. We consider that Mark Farmsteading is a small building group. We will add it to the list. But really at the bottom of page 25, that is the, the crux of the matter is, as a committee, you need to decide whether or not um, it meets that requirement that says proposals with all small building groups will need to accord with and enhance the character of the group and not have a detrimental impact on the character to be considered acceptable. Because uh, another thing that we, we did spot on site is that there's a lack of any clear boundary enclosure running around here. It is just open land running on and uh, that is quite important in the consideration of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, David. Okay, members, we are in session. Ian? I suppose just to get started, it'd be interesting, as I normally say, just to, to hear everybody's view. So I think for me, it's kind of in balance, Chairman. It, it, the site visit was important. So you look at it, and as David's already outlined in the case officer, actually within, contained within the report, you have Mark Farm as a as a identified small building group. It has got that sense of place cohesion, so on and so forth. Uh, but then you've got the gap between a gap, then you've got Mark Cottage, and it fits on the, on, on the road end. No de clear defined boundary at the rear, but obviously a, a fence of some type uh, would would make that uh, clearly defined if, if that was the case. So on balance, like I say, I think it's very much the, as, as you look at this, it, 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 does it fit policy or does it not, or do we actually have to make an exception to policy in this case? So looking at it in simple terms, I thought actually looking at the, the guidance that we've just seen on the screen here, the top left hand side example with the guidance, I thought there's, it shows a small building group, larger than this one certainly, but there was a gap site. In my view when I'm looking at that, to me it fits, that fits the, would fit the criteria. If you're looking at that, so you've got a, a presence of houses being a, 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 a small building group, it's whether we actually decide actually the Mark Cottage comes into that or not. I think on balance that it probably does. But uh, interested to hear what other views are. Can I would be okay with absolutely the, the granting of a permission here, but interested to, to hear what other members are saying, Chairman. That's a quick summary of what I'm thinking. Thanks for that, Ian. Other members? If there are no other members, oh, you David McKean and Andrew Juste, Jim McComb. I think uh, <coughs> it would be wrong to give them planning permission for on this on this site. I don't think it. To be honest with you, I don't think it's a site that's a big enough footprint for for a, a decent house on it. And the surrounding countryside, there's no identifiable boundaries there. And as such, uh, I would move that we refuse this application, Chair. Okay. Uh, Andrew Juste. Thanks, Chair. From the site visit, one of, my, one of the things I observed was that the application is quite close to the building group, and I would be interested because obviously this is plan permit, this is a PIP, which is in principle, so it would be subject to any further application. And I would like to see a further application to, if I'm going to decide on if it fits in with the building group or not, to see what materials are used and what the elevations and such are of the building that they're proposing. That's just a, a comment. 
I'll get David to come in because I think a planning, planning permission in principle establishes a precedent and that then grants. So, but David. Uh, Thank you, Chair. That was exactly what I was going to say. Basically, if, if you grant planning permission in principle, you've accepted the principle of a house within that red line boundary. And the only grounds you would have to refuse it thereafter is if you felt the, the designer materials were inappropriate, but the principle would have been set by that stage. And that's why it's before us in this format today that the, the applicant will then come back with a more detailed design if we approve the, the principle of the thing. So I've got Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Could we go back, please, to the slide which showed the entrance into Mark Farm? We've passed it, uh, David. <laughs> uh, no, there is one, that one, yes. Now that is actually where the entrance occurs. And you can see quite clearly that it is a good 20 metres, maybe 25 metres to the west of the dwelling. And that strikes me as the problem, that it would be extremely difficult to get a rectangular site any closer to the building. You know, it, it states in the report the site is about 40 metres west of the small building group. But given the present nature of the access to the small building group, that's taking up a good 20 metres itself. So to have a, an application which was closer to the SBG would probably require another crescent access, which is not shown in the application. So what you're left with is a gap of 115 metres between Mark Cottage and the SBG. I feel personally that is just too wide a gap. So are you supporting Councillor McKee's proposal that we follow up the recommendation and refuse? I would, in the circumstances here of a rectangular application site, support Councillor McKee. Thank you for that. So we have a proposal by Councillor McKee, a second by Councillor McComb, to go with the recommendation and refuse this application as an alternative proposal. Ian? Obviously, uh, up for advice, because again, it comes back to this, I think it's maybe a pedantic point from my point of view, but it's whether it's an exception to policy or not, so I was keen to get advice in regards to that. Because in my view, I'm thinking it is unbalanced, so I'm looking at the whole small building group, so it's no an extension of, I'm actually taking it in consideration, Mark Cottage as well. Uh, so and it, I'm looking at it as being an infill gap, looking at, like I say, the, the supplementing guys that we have in the, it was the top left-hand side uh, portion of that, so... It's, I mean, I think it has, it's on balance, it is very much on balance. I think the report's quite reflective of what's actually on the ground and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fair enough recommendation. But when I had the site visit, like I say, I think, uh, topographically, it'd be quite simple to alleviate any likes of flooding concerns, things like that, the uh, thing statements that have been made. Access probably would be off the, the frontage in front of the, what's outlined in red there. Uh, I think access would come from there. Uh, I think the, it's been constructed so if you access the front gardens going back to the, it's all part of the cartilage of the house and the, the, the amenity area there. So to me, it fits natural as a gap site. So I would move subject to uh, the, uh, getting clearance in the gap in governance terms that what I'm proposing is uh, competent. I would move that we actually approve it, Chairman. Okay, I'll ask David before I see if there's a second. Or is this a competent motion, David? I think those are, are fair comments, actually. It is one as officers we looked at very closely, and I would agree it is on balance. If you had a situation that um, Mark Cottage didn't exist, which is there, if this was just extending a ribbon of development further out into the countryside uh, where there really is no other development and no logical boundary to stop, we would clearly say it is contrary to policy. But it comes down, as I said earlier, to what's at the bottom of page 25, does it accord with and enhance? As officers, we, we feel that it, it probably doesn't because the nucleus of the group really is around here. And Councillor McCombs' point is a good one. You've got this access here, which does mean that 
effectively from the building all the way down to here is quite a considerable distance. Um, I would say it's one of these ones where it is so finely balanced, I would say it is actually down to a value judgment of the, the members, and it's not really a case of whether it's an exception to policy, because you aren't extending a ribbon of development out into countryside. There is a logical stop to it at Mark Cottage, but that would then mean if you accept this, you would also have to accept that really that site, you would be accepting a you couldn't defensively refuse any application on that site, so you would, as a committee, be saying it's okay to have a ribbon of development running right from Mark Cottage all the way up to here as the small building group. And if members are minded to say yes, they think that is the character of the area, that's fine. It's not one I would regard as an exception to policy in this instance. Okay, I've got Andy Ferguson for the first time, and then David McKee. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Given David's last uh, bit of advice there, it's a value judgment, I'd be happy to second uh, Councillor Crothers' uh, proposal. That we okay, do so we have a proposal and we have a, an amendment. Councillor McKee. Hi, thanks, Chair. I think, uh, unfortunately, Councillor Crothers wasn't there when we were getting a spiel from a lady, a resident in that area, pointing out that uh, the house that proposed was going to be in the top of a hill, but at the bottom of that hill, floods, and floods quite frequently. So and, and uh, it would be unlikely that planning would be uh, keen to give permission to build, to extend the, the line between the two houses that would be left. So I think uh, talking about an extension as a, 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 a talk that's no, not appropriate, would, would, uh, unlikely to happen. We're not having a discussion here. We're, we're at the stage now we've got a motion and an amendment. So, Andy, if it's very brief, we're not having a debate about this, now we're going to the vote. No, it's, I think it's a, a mistake to think that people haven't seen the, the site because they weren't on the site visit, because it's open to anyone. In fact, I'd, that's exactly what I did. Um, of course, much wailing and gnashing of teeth in the back of the car and away at the chocolate bean factory, I must say, but uh, we still did it. So, yeah, it, yes, I, did, I have seen the site. That's okay, no, it's fine. We're, we're, we're going to the vote. Members that have seen the site be content with that. Members that have not been there are still entitled to participate because they have enough information before them to make a value judgment. So, we have a motion, Lucy, and an amendment. And bearing in mind the advice that David City gave, it's not necessarily an exception to policy. It's simply a, a judgment on whether or not it's an appropriate location to, to Ian. No, thank you, Chair. No, I think you've got the words right. I think David said it's. A, I, I believe it's in accordance. Don't have my with speech about this. I think ultimately, I, I know. But as a mover, I've got three minutes ultimately through the standing orders. The only thing I was actually named particularly. No, you haven't. No, I have. You don't need uh, it anyway. You've got. No, your no. Motion. But what I'm saying is, because I was mentioned particularly, I'll just for, for the sake of Councillor McKee's uh, comments, I did ask David when I got on site. So I was five minutes late for the site visit. Uh, was there anything that I'd missed? And David brought my David site. That is uh, the plan officer on. On, uh, on site, brought me fully up to speed in regards to any flooding comments, so on and so forth, and that's why I mentioned the topic, topographical uh, structural change earlier. Okay. Where are these short exchanges? We will go to the vote, Lucy. Okay. Um, so the motion I have is as follows. It's both by Councillor McKee and seconded by Councillor McComb, and that's to go with the recommendations as per the report. And we have an amendment both by Councillor Crothers and seconded by Councillor Ferguson to allow the application based on balanced judgment that the location is deemed appropriate so, and subject to appropriate conditions. Content with that? Okay, right, Lucy. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor John Campbell. Motion. Councillor Crothers. Amendment. Councillor Ferguson. Amendment. Councillor Tuesday. Amendment. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor Martin. Motion. Councillor McComb. Motion. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Murray. Motion. Councillor Tate. Councillor Young. Amendment. And I can confirm that the motion carries with seven votes to five 
And therefore, the decision is that we'll go with the recommendations as per the report, and that is to refuse the application. Thank you, Lucy. Carla, can you invite the elected members back that have uh, declared an interest, please, to be outside in the hall somewhere? Can you invite the members back that have declared an interest, please? Thank you, members. We come to agenda item number five, the erection of an application for the erection of seven dwelling houses, formation of access and internal road layout, installation of shared septic tank and soak away, and associated landscaping at land adjacent to Craig Breck, <coughs> Burn Barrach, Kipford. The application type is full planning permission. The reference number is 18 stroke 1068 stroke full. The recommendation is to refuse. And the case officer is Iona Brook. Iona, will you take us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. The application is indeed for the erection of seven dwelling houses and the formation of access and internal road layout at um, Burn Barrack. Under the scheme of delegation, the application requires to be considered before yourselves as more than six separate individual and time third party objections have been received. The um, Burn Barrack is a small building group which lies approximately 3.5 kilometres south of Dalbeatty. There we go. The site is just here to the right, so you can see the visibility into the site in both directions is reasonably good. The application does seek permission for the erection of seven one and a half dwelling houses. The associated submission details five four bedroom detached dwellings and two three bedroom semi detached dwellings in a linear arrangement serviced by a new access taken from the A seven ten public road. This is the view to the southwest. You can see there there's no um, defensible boundaries to the southwest. This is the view across to Burn Barrack. You can see there that the majority of the houses in Burn Barrack are characterised by single storey bungalow type dwellings in an informal arrangement. This is the entrance into Burn Barrack. Again, it's an informal cluster of small buildings, no pavements, no street lights, and the like. These are the proposed elevations for the dwellings. And this is an layout that is proposed. The supplementary guidance states that a small building group will only be able to be expanded by a maximum of a third of the existing size of the group within any given period plan. And based on the size of the group of the date of the plan is adopted and including unimplemented planning permissions. Currently, Burn Barrack is comprised of 13 dwellings, 11 which sit north of the A710 road and a further two which are read here as the traditional farm type buildings that would have um, served the area. As such, the proposal for seven new dwellings at this site fails the test. The maximum number of any dwellings is permissible within this local development plan would be five. It is therefore considered that the principle of this proposal is contrary to the development plan in that aspect. Furthermore, the siting and um, design is not considered to be um, appropriate in this instance. The majority of the 13 dwellings within the vicinity are single storey, with many sat discreetly and informally back off the main thoroughfare. The, whilst the proposal relates to the development of one and a half storey properties, which would create considerable presence from the public road boundary, given the formal layout and lack of landscaping. Furthermore, it is considered the potential impact of the proposal is somewhat understated in the submission, <laughs> with landscaping only proposed for the adjacent area of open space down here. Whilst the proposed area of open space does create some proposed infill screening, it would provide little way in mitigation, certainly in the short term, until any trees have reached full maturity. In regards to accessing and servicing the, the site, in response to the consultations, both the flood risk team and roads officer concluded that at this juncture, insufficient detail had been provided. However, given the fundamental policy issues with this application, the applicant has not been asked to address these issues, these concerns presently in order to prevent any unnecessary expense. Now, as you'll see from the next slide, 
This is the Howbank Barrack is viewed at the moment. And you'll see that with the A710 public road and the majority of the built environment, the emphasis on the built environment is north to the public road. So the existing pattern of development within Burnbarrack is characterised by a cluster of 11 dwellings situated along the northeastern side of the A710 with the further two dwellings at Craig Bracks. Whilst the site is relatively contained, it is a large site which would result in significant change to the overall character and appearance of the small building group. The existing buildings at Craig Breaks and Craig View, which are here, well, we are read visually as a contained farm unit that is discrete and separate from the main group of residential dwellings and other buildings, which are informally arranged on the other side of the road. The development of the application site would result in significant over-urbanisation of the setting of this rural building group with its formal footprint and introduction of payments. Taking all of the relevant planning considerations into account, it is considered that the principle of the development fails to comply with Local Development Plan Policy H3 and Associated Supplementary Guidance and that the proposed seven dwelling houses would not relate well to the small building group of Burnbarrack and would further increase the size of the small, small building group by more than a third. We therefore recommend that the proposal is refused. Thank you. Thanks, Iona. Any members have any questions for the case officer? Ian? Please. And then Jane. Just a small one. See when, if, if there's any cross sections that shows the difference in uh, the proposed ridge lines to the existing ridge no, lines? No, we don't. No. They won't. No. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Jen? Is there any obligation in planning terms to have the, um, the stated lights and, and pavements? Is there, is there any obligation that we have? David? At present, um, the requirement is if you have more than uh, two properties, then you are required to have an adopted road. Now, there is a move uh, which I must admit, I haven't actually heard the outcome of when it went to the EEI committee last week, which I should have looked into. But the, there was a move to move away from that and adopt the, the national guidelines instead, which would allow up to five with a, um, an unadopted road. But still on this one here, that would trip that boundary, being seven houses. So it would require a full-blown road and uh, street lighting, etc. Right, Jane. Any other questions for case officer? Councillor McKee? I just want <coughs> I just want clarity. In the first picture, it was a slope. Is it the intention that uh, rows of houses will be at different levels? It looked I as know. if it was on the side of a hill. The site is relatively level at the um, forefront of the site, and then there, there you can see the site is relatively level, but it does rise to it sits at forty meters there above sea level, and it rises to. 70 metres, just above 70 metres, just to the brow of the hill. Um, unless there's severe excavations, then yes, it would be slightly elevated. Thanks, Joe. Any other member? In that case, we come to the first registered speakers today. We have Derek Rowan and Agent Lawrence Walsh. We'd like to come forward, please, Derek and Lawrence. Uh, and it's a three-minute presentation, so we're having two minutes from Derek Rowan first, is that right? And then a minute from Lawrence. So I will remind uh, Derek when you're coming up on your two minutes to draw your presentation to a conclusion, please. And we'll move to Lawrence, and he will bring the uh, he will round up your presentation for members. So just whenever you're ready, sir, you'll have two minutes. I'll remind you we have a few seconds to go just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Brief, but I do have two main points to support our argument as to why I think this application should be supported rather than rejected. Why build houses on this site at Banbarach? Well, Banbarach is clearly identified in your development plan as a village suitable for expansion of housing in the Stuartry area. Our planned housing contains two affordable houses which should help attract young families into the area, which should in turn be very good for both the schools, an excellent primary school at Colvend and your brand new all ages campus at Dalbiti. As well as providing uh, families for the schools, it'll help support local shops, hotels, churches. They all need more people in the rural areas. 
and I'm sure that the local economy will benefit from this development, as well as local contractors benefiting from site works and associated landscaping and the building trades, obviously, from the erection of the houses. Secondly, to answer the objections raised, Van Barrich already has a very eclectic mix of housing types. This was not shown on the slide produced by the planning officer. You have 30 seconds to go there. There's down. actually two-storey stone and slate. There's a two-storey wooden house, as well as the original row of cottages and the 60s, 70s development. Flooding has never occurred in all my 68 years in this time. And if it were the will of the planning group, we could quite easily cut our numbers to comply with your recommendation of no more than one third. These, ladies and gentlemen, are my arguments for supporting this application, and I would be pleased to show anyone the site and certainly pleased to answer questions. Time is immaculate, Derek, and uh, I'll wait until... Lawrence does his one minute, and then would you both wait, please, in case elected members have questions for you. So, Lawrence, we'll time you, and I'll tell you with that seconds to go, just to draw your presentation to conclusion. That's kind of you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. My client is simply replicating the mirror image of the seven houses that you see on that drawing as existing. There are seven houses on the opposite side of the road, and on the proposal side of the road, there'll be seven houses. There's not going to be eight, nine, or ten. The reason for the open space at the south end of the site is to retain the outlook for the people in the existing houses. So the 30 seconds to go along. The client will um, house styles are similar in appearance to the council supplementary guidance. Uh, as they said, is there'll be no flooding of the stream. It'll be piped. The applicant is quite willing to delete two, two southmost houses from a dwelling house from the application, if so requested. Um, the deletion also adds weight to the council staff's requirements and will add to a lesser number of houses. The site of approved permission will be landscaped with low level shrubs so as not to obscure Can views of the houses uh, opposite. Conclusion launch, please. I thank you very much, Chair, for the opportunity to speak. I would hope that you would recommend an approval of this application. Thanks very much, Lawrence, and thanks for your brevity as well. That's great. I just hang on a minute, please, in case members have questions for you. Bear in mind, though, members, we cannot suggest that they reduce an application number. The application before you were a set number of application a, a development, and if another, if you refuse this one, they can come back with another application another day. That's fine. But we're not here to discuss how many units should be here. The applications for seven. Hey, but do you have questions for the applicant or the agent? <coughs> Elaine. Uh, thanks, Chair. It's really just uh, the papers that we have indicate from both the Council Roads Officer and the Council Flood Risk Team that insufficient detail was provided for them to be able to comment adequately. And I just wondered why it was that we hadn't had details on the, both the roads and flooding issues for those to be properly assessed. Uh, Yes, you can answer. I think there's a, there's a complication here that the applicant and agent did indeed submit additional information, but it was way beyond the time to do so. Therefore, there is a condition here that we don't allow additional information to be brought to the committee. That would have to come at another date if another application were to be brought forward. But, uh, Derek, did you want to respond to that? Yes, Mr Chairman. We were advised by the planning officer that as it was likely that this application might be recommended for refusal, that we should not waste any more time or money by submitting those extra details at this point. But obviously we'd be more than happy to submit them were there any further look at the application. And can you just, you can't present them, hey, Lawrence, but can you tell members what it was you, you, you gave to the officers recently? <coughs> Uh, well, yes, we, we uh, contacted the um, flood risk people and they said that there's no additional flood risk in that area. Uh, that was with the first application that was withdrawn. And on this application, the same happened. Um, essentially, there will be no flooding in that area if it's to be piped. There is a stream along the front of the site, Chairman, and that will be piped. Uh, so there's no chance of anything flooding into the site. So we have the additional information. I thought it was road stuff. But anyway, we can't be, can't be presented today. What you have before you is the information the case officer has 
and the recommendation presented to you is what the case officer's opinion is. Jane? Um, well, it was really a question about about the layout. I mean, we've been we've been shown a layout here, um, and which arguably remember it's still questions for the applicant. And agent, yes, Jane, and I, 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 I'm I'm I, I am actually about to sort of, if we all permission, ask about about that layout because it's it, it's curious in the sense that it doesn't absolutely ally with what's on the other side of the road. So I, I wonder if I could just ask what the reason for that particular layout was. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Bottle Chairman, up. Mr. Chairman, uh, <coughs> councillors, our sighting of the houses is partly in line with trying to meet the objections from across the road in that we've removed the house from our original ideas, which would have been more in front of the original houses. So our site now sits to the side and is much less obtrusive. It is now opposite the portal frame workshop and the type of housing we've kept the two affordable semi-detached next to the two original houses on that side of the road. So we've tried to make the development read and fit in more with what's already there. That's that, Derek Lawrence. Thank you, Chair. If you look closely at that plan of the existing development on the other side of the road, our development follows the same pattern. In fact, it's a road going off the main road with only one curvature and going up to a final cul-de-sac. Ours has just been turned round the other direction going towards Craybrex, the, the houses uh, on the bottom side of the road. It's exactly the same type of road and exactly the same shape. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Lawrence. Pauline? Sorry, thank you, Chair. May I ask Mr Rowan and the agent, I see from the documents that parking for two cars should be provided. Um, should that be the case within that space available for the seven pr proposed houses is that possible for two cars? Thank you. Derek or Lawrence? On the uh, detailed plans, um, they're not shown at the, at the moment. On the detailed plans, there is two parking spaces on the engineer's drawings, uh, two parking spaces for each dwelling house. In other words, each dwelling house, proposed dwelling house, will have parking for two cars. Thank you. Pauline? Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. Uh, John Young. Thank you, Chair. Um, similar to Council Maitland, I find the layout a bit curious, and it's an observation that the entrance road could support a mirror development on the other side, another similar size block, and that's my concerns. I don't know if the agent or the applicant wishes to comment on that possibility. Lawrence is going to comment. I think. I think, Mr Chairman, it's very much a standalone development trying to blend in with the village and trying to mirror what's already there. We have actually gone the other way in that we've taken a house out and put more landscaping and a associated shrubbery, which is separating the houses from the golf course. So I don't really see why we would want to build more houses right adjacent to the golf course partly on an amenity angle and mainly on a safety angle. So I think it's most unlikely that open space would be scheduled for housing. Mind you, we're no, uh, considering what might happen here, we're, we're dealing with a, an application that's before us. John A. Martin? It's just on that, the point about parking spaces. Is one of the two Spartans parking spaces to be provided? Is one of them the garage? As a garage doesn't meet requirements for it. the garage is shown don't meet requirements of, as to be classed a parking space. There's sufficient in every garden to have two parking spaces and a garage if required, Chair. Thanks, Lawrence. If there are, oh, Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Mr. Rowan, could you remind us how many of the thirteen properties are not single story? <coughs> Chairman, there are two of the 13 properties that are not single storey within the actual village. But if you include the associated areas, i.e. the old schoolhouse and pottery and the Barn Barrack Estate House, you go up to four stroke five, two storeys, but two within the existing village. 
Thank you, Jim. Questions for applicant agent? If there are no more gentlemen, thank you very much for your presentation. If you'd like to resume your seat, I'd be grateful. Members were in session. Ian Blake. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the, the proposed development not matching the other side of the road. Uh, and I, I think it's maybe an important fact that, that all members actually have a look at this. I, I know the area well, but I think it would be of assistance to other members. In addition to that, the report at 410 uh, notes that the, the proposed development, uh, that the four other dwelling houses have their back gardens and rear eleva elevations facing the A710. Uh, if, uh, from my knowledge of the, of the situation, three of the properties on the other side of the road also have their rear elevations and uh, rear gardens facing the A710. So I, th I would certainly propose a site visit on this occasion. Okay, well, until we decide that, that stops our discussion. Is there a support for a site visit, Ian? I don't know this area hardly at all. I think I've been there thrice in my life down in that area, so apologies, Chair. It would certainly be a great advantage to myself if that's possible. I would I would certainly support or second if it's needed in regards to a uh, site visit. Especially with the topography as well question, I think that would would uh, certainly support a site visit. Thanks for that, Ian. So we have a proposal for a site visit. Is there an alternative proposal? In that case, oh, Jane. Yes, Chairman. Um, I, I don't think we need a site visit because one of the reasons um, given um, in the recommended decision um, is a policy decision which is about expanding a small building group by more than a third. And you don't need to go and visit it to work out the, the arithmetic uh, in the small building group. So I think actually it's incumbent upon us to make a decision and without the ex added expense of going out to... Uh, to a site visit. Okay, Councillor McKay. I'm happy to second Councillor Maitland. Okay, so we have a motion from Ian Blake, seconded by Ian Carruthers for a site visit. We have an amendment by Jane Maitland, a seconded by David McKay, that we have enough information before us to determine this application today. Lucy, take us to the vote, please. Okay, we have an, a motion proposed by Councillor Blake and seconded by Councillor Crothers to go on a site visit and an amendment proposed by Councillor Maitland and seconded by Councillor McKee that a site visit would not be necessary and that there is sufficient information in the report. I'll go to the vote. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor John Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Doogie Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Crothers. Motion. Paul, Councillor Drysdale. Motion. Councillor Ferguson. Sorry, amendment. Councillor Tuesday. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Motion. Councillor Lever. Amendment. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Murray. Amendment. Councillor Tate. Amendment. Councillor Young. Amendment. And I can confirm that the amendment carries by 11 votes to 6, and therefore members will determine the application today. Thank you for that, Lucy. So we're in session. Mem oh, Andy. Thanks. Just a bit of clarity from David, maybe. <coughs> um, I see that the developer contributions, they're setting out Dolbiti Nursery and then Dolbiti High School, but uh, what... what plans have we put in place for all through schools now? Because that looks like two bites at the cherry. I mean, there's probably a good explanation for it, but it's just the way it reads. David? In terms of the um, likelihood table that we get from education, they do separate the, the issues for nursery and the other schools, so that's advice we have from education that they are looking for individual part. Thanks, Andy. Okay, members for the session. If there are... Ian? No, just so 
couple of questions I thought were better for the officer rather than the, the, the applicant and his agent. So when I was looking at that, I the site visit would have helped me, but looking at it, it looks very old school layout, so to speak, with actually look at the, the previous stuff, and it looks from the 1970s or 80s when it was built, looks more like designing streets, where the, the, the other one looks like the Road Scotland Act. Uh, kind of late, but I can understand now why after the explanation, okay, that they've done that to accommodate the, the, the dwellings on the other side, spoiling their views, so on and so forth. But it still looks old school, but when it, it comes to, so there's two points. Does, when it comes to roads, so information was, wasn't asked because it was up, they felt it was against policy anyways, but when it comes to the roads, roads construction, would that comply with current roads construction? And it, I think it did go up to five, but it, there was a slight change uh, at the EI committee last week, but would that comply that, that design there? And say that was to be, be approved, obviously that's a 60 mile an hour road, would it merit a 30 mile an hour speed limit restriction? Iona, do you want to deal with that or David? David. Right. It is quite a difficult one to answer because we have got quite clear comments from the, the roads officer that they've got insufficient, insu can't say it, insufficient detail to answer that. Now, while something was an additional plan was submitted, that wasn't received until the 19th. So that's insufficient time for a roads officer to have a look at it and see if it does actually answer any of her questions. So the short answer is we've got not enough detail from the roads perspective to answer your question, I'm afraid. Thanks, Ian. Pauline? Um, David Sutty, I hope you don't mind me asking this question, but from a design perspective, uh, back to Councillor Maitland's point, um, aesthetically to me, if those houses were designed at a slight angle, can the roads and services be, can, can the houses be serviced by water and electricity at an angle or is that not possible? I'm not up to scratch with design. So even if they were sitting at an angle, so it would be more aesthetic potentially, is that serviceable is my question. I know it's a bit waffly, but I'm not sure how to present it. Thank you, David. David, David will answer it, but remember we are, determining an application that's before us, Pauline, so we're not here to design it, and the officers are recommending we refuse this particular one, but certainly advice, David, for Pauline, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, you just gave me my answer. Uh, we have that layout as what's before us, so that's what the committee are considering. Thank you. Okay, members. Oh, did Jane, you indicate you want to speak? Ian Blake? Yeah, Jane's in the half, it's you, Ian. Sorry, I'm, I'm rather confused. Was it me? <laughs> <laughs> I um, thought you indicated to speak, and when I invited you, you shook your hand as if you weren't looking to speak. So right. I, I then went to Councillor Blake, but I suppose Councillor Blake will be happy to defer to you if you're looking to speak, Jane. Well, what I was simply going to say is that um, I think probably um, the... The committee realises that we've got to deal with what we've got in front of us, um, and and it does not comply with our current or indeed <coughs> draft local development plan as it stands at the moment. So it's actually absolutely cut and dried. Um, I think we should refuse it, as per recommendation. So just help me out. Are you proposing that we we support the officer's recommendation here? I will refuse? propose that. Yes. Thank you, Jane. Ian Blake. I, thank you, Chairman. It certainly wasn't to, to second that at this stage. Uh, it's going back to the point that I raised when I tried to get a site visit at 4.10. Uh, I, I think it's important that we maybe have a look at that. If we could get the image up that shows the, the frontage of Sing Shingalek and uh, the other properties. Uh, that, probably, that, that would certainly do for the, for the other properties. Uh, uh, to, the, to the planning officer, uh, would you agree? Is that the frontage of the house? Would you agree that that's the rear of these houses and the rear gardens or the front? That's my first point. I would say they've got, uh, they've got an elevation of aspect that do give an, an, an idea of being frontage. Like, I appreciate that the, the main elevation that is used as uh, an entrance point will be to the rear of the properties, but they do look like they are fronting the public road um, and as designed. The gardens, <coughs> in this instance, to four houses would certainly it would be the, when you're driving through the small whole, small building group of Barrack, It would be the rear gardens and the rear elevation that would be the the main prominent vistas. Yeah, uh, right. Only I'll obviously need to accept that. It's just a it's just a matter of, of uh, opinion as far as that one's concerned. If we go back to Shingle Lake, the the, the property. 
There are one photograph, but there, that's it. No, no if you go back. That's, <coughs> that's Shingalek, the one and a half story property. Yeah. And that's the one that would be directly across the road from the, the proposed development. Mm. Uh, it's, just, it's just to give, again, since we're not going to the site visit, it's just to show that, that the relationship of a one and a half property next to the development. It was just to make members aware that that's that the point. Thank you. Iona, will you try and remember to switch your microphone off, please? It causes an echo when other members are speak. Thanks, Iona. Uh, I now have Ian Carruthers and then Elaine Murray. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be brief. I mean, I think. No connected. It, it's it's probably going back to the some of the comments I've made previously. I think it's it's does it actually fit with designing streets? Maybe not. Maybe it goes back to old school. So that's not a big issue, but it's certainly a bit of an issue for myself. So it's design a layout. Uh, does it comply with the maximum of third? Whether we agree with that or no, actually it doesn't need to comply with that. And that's where I probably have got a difficulty just with that one. Uh, there was some comments made by the applicant and, and his agent in regards to that, but. Obviously, we have to determine. I think that was the, the clarity that was given by yourself in particular, Chairman. We, we determine what's in front of us. So, at this moment in time, I certainly haven't got re reasons to go against the recommendations. Thanks for that, Ian. Elaine? Yes, I just wanted to sec uh, second Councillor Maitland's proposal that we refuse the application uh, on the grounds that it's contrary to policy. Um, if we start uh, approving things contrary to making exceptions to policy, we will we do you know open the doors to all sorts of other people who also want to have an exception to policy, as we do later on today. In fact, so I'd second uh, Councillor Maitland's proposal that we refuse the application. Thanks, Elaine. Ivor. Yes, maybe just a bit of clarification. There's been a lot of mention with regard to the possibility of taking two houses out, and I realise that that's not in front of us today, but. I wouldn't like to think that we're sitting here possibly giving false hope. You know, is that the main reason that we are actually looking not to approve this? Because if Craig Brex and Craig View are part of the application or the small building group, then I suppose the houses between the two ends of the, the development would be part of the thing. And if a further application was to come in, it might meet criteria of being within the small building group. But I wouldn't like to think we're raising hopes to say that it's just the reason that there's seven houses and not the five as uh, in the report. Could you maybe just clarify, are both of the reasons strong enough to refuse so that if they do bring roads and whatever back, or is it just the seven that seems to be the main stumbling block? According no, to the I, I think the discussion either in the committee is seven uh, is the main step. But if you read the recommendation, it says quite clearly the uh, refusing the following grounds: the proposed development is contrary to increasing Galway local development plan policy H three. So it's contrary no matter whether you bring one, four, or forty-four. Now, whether members are sympathetic to a smaller amount or no is a different thing. And I wouldn't want the applicant to go away if members refuse this today on the belief that bringing a smaller number back will make a difference. Every application will be considered by officers, and only when they make a recommendation to us will we consider that recommendation and the application before us. The recommendation by the officer is quite clear. Chair, it quite clearly says in the last the small building group by more than a third, so therefore the number is important. That's a secondary consideration to H3, I would suggest. David, can you help Iva? Uh, Chair, y yes, just to say that there are very clearly there. In particular, the proposal would not be well related to the small building group of Barnbarrick and would expand the small building group by more than a third. So th those are two reasons why a seven-house scheme is unacceptable. We obviously can't give a, a definitive ruling as officers as to how the members are going to view it, but certainly if you would look at page 29, which shows the location plan, that does illustrate that really from where it says Barnbarrick would running all the way around on the, the south side of the road to Barnbarrick Lodge, there is only those two farm-related units. There's not a pattern, never has been a pattern, of residential development on that side of the road. It does, to that extent, as a small building group, remind me of one such as Holly, where there's a clear character that we've seen in the past of development on one side of the road. There is no logical boundary beyond that. So I... As officers, if uh, an application came back for four houses on that site, we would still recommend refusal for it. 
but obviously the decision as to whether or not you would accept that as a committee is a, a different matter, but as officers we would be unable to support it. I've got Ian Blake and then Andy Ferguson, and we'll try and go to the, the, the recommendation because we have a motion amend a motion, sorry, seconded before us. Ian Blake. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to make it clear that I'm certainly I'm not support, uh, supporting this application as it presently stands because it clearly exceeds the, the third in the development. But I was keen to get the rest of the, the discussion out and to have the matter in, uh, really discussed so that we do not give the applicant uh, false hope in the future. I think it, it, it was important that we explain it today. Uh, but uh, I'm certainly I'm not putting forward an amendment in this case. Thanks, Ian. And no, I'm anxious as well. The applicant should, and the agent should be aware that they can come back at any time with any kind of application they wish to bring, and we are obliged to consider it as, as members and as officers are. But uh, I wouldn't want to send a signal that uh, a smaller amount or a different design would be acceptable because that's not what elected members appear to be saying within the whole of the chamber. Okay, Andy Ferguson, and then we'll try and go to the decision members. OK, could we go back to the, the last slide, the colour slide? Um, the, the one, the, that one, yeah. No, back, the, that one, yeah. The white building on the left, that's part of the, the small building group. That, that's the farm buildings. The, yes. There's two houses at the but, far but is end. That classed as, the question is, is, is that classed as part of the small building group? Or is the small building group purely on the other side of the road? There is no defined small building group. It's not like where you have a settlement and you have a very clear settlement boundary around it. It's a difficult one to say. I mean, my, my personal view is that you we weren't of the view that you could categorically say that this land didn't fall within the small building group by virtue of the fact that you've got signs that when you come in and go out of it, the majority of the housing is on the other side, so it's whether or not it, it meets with the character and enhances the character of it, the, the same issues we looked at with Mark Farm. So, in short, yes, I think you would probably say those buildings are within the small building group, but just because they fall within it doesn't make other development acceptable. Okay, members, it seems that we have a, a, a sympathy with the applicant and agent, but the, the, the move seems to be refusing this at this moment in time, bearing in mind we only have what's before us to decide upon. We have a motion and amendment as an alternative proposal. In that case, Lucy, can you uh, advise the members of the public vote decision of the committee as today, please? In relation to item five, members have decided to go with the recommendations and refuse the application as per the report. Thank you, Lucy. Right, members, we come to agenda item number six, change of use of ground floor retail unit class one to form coffee shop class three. Alterations include enlargement of window opening to form door opening and rear elevation and installation of awning to front elevation at 37 George Street, Whithorn. This is a full application. The application reference number is 18 stroke 1786 stroke full. The recommendation is approved subject to conditions and the case officer it is Mary Mitchell. Mary, will you take us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, this application has come to committee because the Whithorn Community Council have objected to it. Um, the main reasons for their objection are, one, that the change of use would increase vehicle and pedestrian movements at the rear of the application site to the detriment of the neighbouring uh, amenity and the detriment of road safety, and two, the physical alterations, particularly to the front elevation, uh, should be appropriate to the historical nature of the street, which forms part of the conservation area. I'll take you through the slides. The, uh, the application site is in the centre of Whitthorn, in the conservation area and um, in the uh, designated town centre. It's one of the um, traditional mid-terraced properties um, along the high street. There is uh, rear access to the property um, via, I don't know how well you know Whitthorn, but the, the public toilets are just at the, at the back of that site. Um, and uh, where's my pointer? 
You can drive along this road here, which is the pended access, which takes you up to the Whithorn Priory. Um, and there's a ha hard standing area here, so you can gain access up this way. There's an existing garage on the site there, and there's also an existing pedestrian gate here. This property here is the Whithorn Trust building, um, and they were one of the objectors. These are the existing plans. Um, the ground floor of the property is um, mostly residential, apart from this area here, which used to be a shop, and this area was the storage for the shop. Um, they haven't been used for a while. Um, the building is used as a house at the moment. These are the existing elevations. You can see this is the, uh, the timber garage, which is proposed for removal at the back. Um, this is the, the street frontage. There's a, um, a traditional shop frontage um, uh, at the front there. Uh, the proposed plans show all of the ground floor is to be a coffee shop. There's a small outside seating area here um, and a small sort of street cafe, just a couple of chairs and tables at the front there. Um, at the rear, they're proposing to change a window into a door and also to alter um, these glazed doors here. This is uh, the front elevation. So very few changes to the front elevation apart from painting to the, the timber work and um, the installation of an awning at the front. These are the details of the, um, the new doors at the rear. Uh, details of the, um, the gate which will replace the timber garage at the, the rear and details of the awning as well. There would be a, an awning box put above the, the shop frontage. This is uh, the proposed awning. This is a, an old photograph of the street frontage and you can see the, the building used to have an awning. This is the application building here. And about 10 years ago, this shop ceased trading. So this is what the building looks like at the moment. The front elevation. That's the shop frontage. It's to be painted blue instead of red. This is to the rear. You can see the timber garage here with the, um, there's a access for a vehicle there. There's also a pedestrian side gate here. All of this area here is, um, this is the part of the Whithorn Trust building. The timber garage, the pedestrian gate. That's looking out onto the Whithorn, the rear of the Whithorn Trust building. This is inside the application site, looking at the rear elevation. So these glazed doors are due to change, and this um, sash and case window is to be changed into a door. This is looking up the garden at the timber garage again. So it is uh, concluded that um, any increase in pedestrian and vehicle movement to the rear of the site would not be significant. The main entrance to the coffee shop is from George Street. One or two disabled patrons a day um, would not create a residential amenity conflict or road safety concerns. Um, and the proposed physical alterations are appropriate and would preserve the character of the conservation area. So all in all, the proposal is considered to benefit the Whithorn Town Centre and is welcomed. The recommendation is for approval. Thank you, Mary. Questions for the case officer? Ian and then Ian. Yeah, I have a, I have a couple of points, but I would ask Mary that when she's, if, if we go back to the, the, the drawings, 
when you're using the laser, it's, it's, I could find it eventually, but if you say top left and then put the laser, rather than me having to look all, or us having to look all over the, the, the screen and find it. I was almost a bit too behind you there. No, no. Uh, going back to the, uh, the, VA, the, the, ex, the entrance at the back, uh, does applicant have control over the land that is the attended drop-off area? Uh, I think there's some reference to parking. Uh, is there any disabled parking, and where is it? Uh, because not every disabled person gets dropped off. Some like to take their own car and park and, and go. Thank you. Mary? I don't know what the private access um, agreements are at the rear of that building, and they aren't part of the planning considerations. Um, there are um, established accesses existing on that site. Um, uh, the, the proposal would be that they're going to keep the vehicle access only for um, uh, the residential parking of the, uh, a car for the, the people who live in the, the building there. The pedestrian side gate would be for the occasional disabled patron of the coffee shop. Ian? Uh, just to clarify, is there, is there any disabled parking or is it solely no, no. a disabled drop-off? No, not, not for, for the coffee shop. Okay, I have Ian Carruthers. Similar kind of points here. So 416, it ref I think it refers to paragraph 4.16 to disabled, uh, I thought it was parking, maybe it's drop-off. Uh, so there's, is there no disabled parking? Because I'd uh, just... That's there is no said. parking um, for the specifically for the coffee shop on site. No. Thanks, Ian. Right, okay. Any other questions for the case officer? In that case, we come to the, the next speaker, which is Hazel Smith, the agent. If Hazel's present, would you like to come forward, please? You will. <laughs> Have three minutes, Hazel, to make a presentation. I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And, and just whenever you're ready, thank you. Oh, and there's a little button on the right-hand side of the console. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. My clients, Mr and Mrs Harrison, are local business owners of a holiday let in B&B in Whitthorn and purchased number 37 George Street in the centre of Whitthorn last year in order to convert the previous sweetie shop and news agent that closed approximately 10 years ago with an existing residence above into a coffee shop. Part of the downstairs and all of the upstairs have remained as a home since the shop closed. Planning consent had been obtained to change it also into residential but wasn't implemented. My clients wish to convert all of the downstairs into the coffee shop and retain the upstairs as their home. There is access directly off George Street and a long-standing servitude right of access to the rear of the property for all traffic, pedestrian, vehicular and otherwise over and across the yard since 1971. This area is shared with the public toilets, storage sheds, rear access to residences on Bruce Street and rear access to the Whithorn Trust. My clients currently have a wooden garage they wish to take down and form a carport with timber bifold doors in keeping with the con conservation area setting. There's also a pedestrian access gate closer to the rear of the property which provides access for the filling of the existing oil tank. My clients wish to retain this pedestrian gate access but for it to be lowered to provide a pedestrian or uh, provide a, an accessible threshold and level access into the coffee shop. They don't envisage an increase in pedestrian or vehicular traffic, parking or use of the gate or carport, but in keeping with the Scottish Government's Disability Delivery Plan and DG Voice, the voice of disabled people in Dumfries and Galloway, they wish to provide facilities that will be fully accessible for all from the street with provision of disabled toilet facilities within and rear access to, to ensure that the coffee shop meets all modern day acceptable standards and is fully accessible to all, but also provides two escapes from the front and the rear. In our uncertain times, it's essential for the public to feel safe and by having two fully accessible escape options to the front and the rear of the property would enable disabled people to fully participate as full and equal citizens. The proposed changes to the front of the property have been carefully designed to be within keeping of the surrounding conservation area. Historic photos have been referred to and the hanging sign and awning will be reinstated as they originally would have looked in Victorian times. The sash and case windows are retained and the timbers to the windows, the doors and shop frontage sympathetically repainted in a tasteful colour scheme in keeping with the building's age and surrounding historical streetscape. This application meets the development plan policies and guidance criteria and is fully supported by the planning department. 
It would be a much needed and welcome facility for locals to go, and tourists alike to enjoy in Whitthorn and will indeed provide local employment. The character of the conservation area would be enhanced, road access and safety would be unaffected, residential amenity would be improved with the provision of this new service. I would ask that you approve this application. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hazel. Members, questions? Ian? Something I quick and hope you love it, some, but paragraph 3.1. Uh, probably where my questions were coming from, uh, Hazel. It's objections uh, from Whitehorn Trust, but they seem to be under the impression, or the, their, their perception is that this may, I, I'm, oh, I'm reading it anyway, there may be a conflict in, uh, because of increased traffic, in particular around about disabled. Could you just say a, a few things about that? Because you, from what I'm hearing for yourself, from the case officer, that wouldn't be the case at all, but if we would get that clarity. Sure, Chair. Um, my client's certain intention was purely to retain the carport for their own use at the rear and uh, have the pedestrian access gate to be able to, for somebody to be able to be dropped off if they were um, needing to get access to the rear. But they, they, there will be full disabled access at the front and there is parking on the street, so you could easily park and gain access there. But there is... Um, it's a, a mixed use area to the back and cars do park at the obviously at the public toilets but there isn't a disabled toilet in the public toilet so um there is the option that you could park and access from the rear but also from the front i think the clients felt strongly they didn't uh, they wanted to provide options for both but didn't see that as an increase in what is already happening if that clarifies yeah Aye, so so it's because it's it's no wholly, wholly obvious to me because i don't, don't know it don't know the area but I would imagine that you're not looking to create any obstructions or anything like that to the existing uses. No, no. Thank you. Any other questions for the agent? In that case, Hazel, thanks very much for your okay. presentation. Just Thank resume you. your seat. Thank you. Thank you. Members were in session. Oh, I've got Ivor and then Ian Carruthers. Chair, just to move the recommendation. Ian, agreed. Thank you, Lucy. Just confirm the decision of the committee, please. And in relation to item six, members have agreed to the recommendations, which is to approve subject to conditions as per the report. Thank you, Lucy. We come to agenda item number seven, <coughs> installation of underground electricity cable, temporary construction corridor and associated substation incorporating switch gear building at Windy Rig. Wind Farm, the Prison Galloway to Black Hill Substation, East Ayrshire. This is a full application, the reference number is 18 stroke 1821 stroke full. The recommendation is approved subject to conditions and the case officers Chris McTeer. Chris, just take us through your presentation when you're ready, please. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, the uh, application is before members today. Uh, as it constitutes major development as defined in the hierarchy of developments and in the Council's scheme of delegation. Um, the background uh, to this application is uh, in paragraph 1.6 on page 54 of your committee papers, but just as a quick recap, um, Windy Rig Wind Farm was approved by members in December 2017 and comprises 12 wind turbines up to 125 metres to the blade tip. Um, this application is for the installation of a 33 kilovolt uh, underground grid connection cable. Uh, it's approximately 5.8 kilometres in total length with two kilometres lying within Dumfries and Galloway and the remaining uh, cable lying within the East Ayrshire Council area. So as you can see on the location plan, the thick black line uh, just Cutting through the application site just above where it says Windy Standard is, uh, is, is the line between ourselves and East Ayrshire Council. The uh, substation and switching infrastructure um, is lying within the, uh, the East Ayrshire Council area as well. So as you can see from the site layout there, um, the wind farm site is outlined in blue and there uh, in red just at the top is um, the application that we're looking at today. Um, the application itself comprises of um, the excavation of a one and a half meter by one and a half meter box trench uh, and involves the creation of a temporary working corridor of up to 30 meters wide uh, to support a temporary access uh, that's required to, uh, to construct it. 
in terms of accessing the site itself, um, it's accessed uh, from bo both ends of the cable, but for uh, for the purposes of ourselves, um, it's accessed from within the wind farm site. Um, the application is being progressed in tandem uh, with East Ayrshire Council. Uh, they had intended, uh, the case officer had intended to take it to their committee tomorrow, uh, but there has been a delay um, with that. But um, we are, we've sent them our conditions and a copy of the report as well, just so that they know uh, what we are doing uh, with this one. Um, so you can see there's the uh, the cable trench detail, um, the bottom section of that is full of sand uh, to prevent overheating and then the uh, it's going to be backfilled with rock and peat soil that has been taken out uh, during excavations. Um, we've not had any objections from statutory or internal consultees uh, subject to conditions uh, for this one. The uh, cable route itself uh, was chosen to avoid any sensitive areas and there is a 25 metre microsite allowance uh, recommended for this one uh, at the discretion of the ecological clock of works which is also required by condition um, as, as part of this application although the applicant had um, intended to uh, to employ an eco uh, with this anyway and they would require one for the wind farm itself. Um, the landscape uh, is remote, uh, the, the site is not readily visible and given the nature of the development um, it will be absorbed into the landscape without any significant uh, visual impacts and so for the outlines, for the reasons uh, outlined in the report um, this one is recommended to be approved subject to conditions. Thank you. Thanks Chris. Questions for the case officer, Jane? Um, <coughs> do we consult the Council's landscape architect. I mean, I'm thinking about particularly with respect to um, the peat treatment. Now everybody's got wildly excited about peat um, and carbon. Yes. Is, is there any need to, and, and who indeed in the Council do we actually uh, speak to about such matters now? Is there somebody left? Um, yes, we do have um, a landscape architect, although in this instance, um, given that it's, um, it's, it's excavation, um, we didn't consult them. Um, in terms of the actual peat, what comes out of, um, what comes out of the ground, that falls within SEPA's remit. Um, SEPA um, will uh, we'll look for information for that. Now, I'm pretty sure that part of the CEMP um, that we're looking for is condition four, page 62, um, there will possibly be, yeah, Part G, um, they're looking for a finalised peat management plan as, 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 as part of that because um, SEPA won't allow um, disposal of, of peat, so it needs to be reused somewhere, but it'll mostly be backfilled into the, into the cable trench. Thanks, Jane. Any other questions for case officer? Ivor? Chair, I know the uh, planning history at 1.16, this document lists eight proposed water crossings. Uh, do any of these affect any salmonids? Uh, and have the relevant salmon fishery boards been uh, consulted with regards to this application? Okay. Um, I don't think so. I think the, the water crossings are relatively minor. Um, there are going to be potentially some impacts on drinking water. There were, um, there was a Scottish Waters full um, response, while they have no objections, um, was to recommend that part of the CEMP, um, they, they looked at um, impacts on private water supplies and that there shouldn't be any um, impacts on it because there are one or two. Um, the, most of the catchment kind of falls down into the Afton um, sort of beyond um, our our part of the of the site um, so as as far as I know the, um, the 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 water crossings are relatively minor there's nothing there's not sort of fishing rivers as such but I, I don't think we consulted with the the fisheries board yeah, on that one are the spawning grounds because that could be a up. danger to the environment uh, you know for spawning grounds if you're going to be digging them up I thought it would be too high up for that either. It, it, it's, it's a fairly, fairly high landscape. But what you could do is you could have a condition put on this permission in, it, in, in addition to what uh, Chris has 
suggested that we do consult with the, with the Salmon Fishery Board just to make sure they're satisfied. David's got some ob observation. Um, just, Chair, to advise members on page 62, you've got condition 4E. <coughs> One of them is a pollution prevention plan, which is something that would cover issues such as potential river pollution. Content with that, Ivor? Okay. Any other questions for case officer? In that case, members, we have no speakers. We're in session. Agreed? Okay, we'll go with the recommended. Can you just uh, remind members of the decision, please, Lucy? And in relation to item 7, members have agreed the recommendations as per the report, and that's to approve subject to conditions. Thanks, Lucy. Come to agenda item number 8. Application for planning permission for erection of dwelling house, installation of septic tank and soak away, formation of access, and siting of temporary storage container at land opposite Broad Park, Ash Road, Dumfries. This is a full application. Reference numbers 18 stroke 1880 stroke full. The recommendation is to refuse. And the case officer is Billy Murray. Billy, will you just take us through your presentation when you're ready, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. As you say, this is an application for planning permission for the erection of a new dwelling house in the countryside. It would be on a small holding uh, just to the southwest of Dumfries. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll take you through the images. Uh, that's the location plan. It's just Terregal's uh, top left-hand corner there, and Dumfries, uh, the southwestern side of Dumfries, is shown. Um, this is just to clarify exactly where the designated settlement boundary of, of Dumfries is in relation to the application site. The dark black line is the designated settlement boundary in the LDP. Um, this is a closer view of the application site. The dwelling house on the opposite side of the road to the south is unconnected, as is the dwelling, as are the dwelling houses on either side to the southeast and the northwest. Um, this again this is an aerial view uh, of the application site. The application site is in red. Uh, the land in the applicant's ownership is outlined in blue. Uh, extends to approximately 20 acres. Um, this is a view of the application site from the northwest on the public road, so the dwelling house would be between uh, the location where I'm standing and the house uh, there at Broad Park on the opposite side of the road. This is also a view from approximately the same location uh, on the public road. Uh, the level of the site there is set above the public road. That's a view of the southwestern site frontage onto Ash Road. The application site would be in the level field on the left behind the hedge and fence. Um, that's looking back down Ash Road towards Dumfries. Uh, so that's the northwestern site frontage onto Ash Road. Again, the application site is on the right in that view in the corner of the field. Uh, this is a view of the site from the southeast on Ash Road. Uh, dwelling house at Broad Park is seen opposite in that view. Um, the, up, the, the house itself would be in the distance in that view. Um, apologies. Uh, so that is the application site um, from the existing field gate in the southeastern corner of the site. That's a closer view of the, the area of the site where the dwelling house is proposed. Uh, these are the drawings submitted with the application, so that's location and site plans. Um, this is the site plan showing the extent of the ownership. Uh, I showed that uh, as an aerial view earlier. Um, this is um, the design of the proposed house. Um, this is a sketch visualization submitted with the application. Um, the house is shown on the left there. Uh, the building on the right is an agricultural building, which is the subject of the next item on this agenda. Uh, and the polytunnel to the rear has already got prior approval, but has not yet been erected. This is a grazing plan which shows uh, the applicant's 
owned land in blue uh, and the other land uh, that's rented uh, in green. So there are four parcels of rented land uh, and the owned land, the 20 acres at the small holding shown in blue in that plan. Uh, this is the proposed storage container unit that is part of the application. So advice is that um, a case has not been made under H3 to show an overriding need for a dwelling house at this location uh, based on the land holding and operational characteristics of the unit. Uh, and secondly, that a high quality design has not been achieved in terms of OP2. Uh, so the recommendation is to refuse for the two reasons stated. Thank you, Billy. Uh, questions for the case officer members? Okay, in that case, members were in session. If there are no questions and no answers, then we are agreeing the officer's recommendation. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, that's a unanimous decision. Can you just confirm the decision, members, please, Lucy? And in relation to item 8, members have refused. Agreed. The recommendations as per the report and that is to refuse the application. Thank you, Lucy. We come to agenda item number nine. An application with the direction of agricultural building at land opposite Broad Park, Ash Road, Dumfries. It's a full application, full planning permission, reference 18 stroke 1879 stroke full. Uh, the recommendation is approved subject to conditions and again the case of Billy Murray. Would you just take us through your presentation again, Billy, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. This is an application for an agricultural building uh, at the same location and by the same applicant as the previous application. So that's the location plan again. Site plan. In that view, the, the proposed building would be in the right, the southeastern part of the site. Again, showing the application site in red and the land ownership in blue. Uh, that's a view of the application site in the field. Application site from Ash Road. This is from Ash Road on the south, from the southeast. Um, the, the building would be in the closest part of the site in that view. Uh, that is the application site itself from Ash Road. That's where the, the proposed agricultural building would be. Location site plans submitted by the applicant. Um, proposed floor plan and elevations of the building. So advice is that this is a, a modest agricultural building. It's a non-contentious proposal. The recommendation is to approve subject to condition. Thank you, Billy. Questions for the case officer? None. In that case, we're in session. Members inclined to support this application? Great. Thank you. Just confirm the decision of the committee, please, Lucy. And in relation to item nine, members have decided to go with the recommendations as per the report, and that is to approve the application Subject to conditions. Thank you, Lucy. Come to agenda item number 10, an application for internal alterations at Militia House, English Street, Dumfries. The application type is listed building consent. The reference number is 18 stroke 1903 stroke LBC. The recommendation is to approve unconditionally. And the case officer is Beth Halliday. Beth, will you take us through? <coughs> Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Listed building consent application for internal alterations to Militia House, English Street in Dumfries. The reason this application is before you today is because the application has been made by Dumfries and Galloway Council. Um, the reason these works are required is to allow the building to meet the Council's Smarter Working Programme. <clears throat> I'll take you through the slides. So the, the block plan, obviously, it's, it's the building next door to this one, so you'll all be familiar with which building it is. Um, the plans that I have, there's five levels. Um, the plans, because of the, the, the um, notation is very small, you're not really going to see very much from the plans that I'm presenting today from that, but in 1.3 of the report, 
I have listed the the um, alterations that are to be made. Um, a lot of it is because the, in the plans they've actually got the working stations, etc. There's quite a lot of detail with it, just showing some of the movable items. So this is the eastern elevation uh, showing the main entrance door into what's actually shown as level two on the plans. And the north elevation, which shows the glazed extension to the, to the rear, which holds level five. And then that's the front elevation facing onto English Street that most people are familiar with. Um, and the existing reception area on level two, um, the, the, wall, the, the wall with the door at the back is actually one of the walls, one of the partition walls to be taken down. And that's just an example of a suspended ceiling to be replaced. There's a lot of suspended ceilings throughout the, the building to be replaced. And again, on, I think that was the second floor, an ex example of a partition wall to be taken down. And an example of a door opening to be blocked up, although from what I can gather, the actual, it will be a little bit like this door here, in that they'll, they'll be keeping the space in between <clears throat> and again, a partition wall in the existing kitchen again to be taken down. And an example of a door to be blocked up where a new opening is to be formed, that was in level two as well. Um, the reason these works are required, oh no, I've said that, sorry, the recommendation is to approve unconditionally. Thank you, Beth. Any questions for Case Officer Andy and then Jane Maitland? It's just an observation, Chair. You see the the drawings we've got that are so small we can't read. Would we accept that of another developer? Because we should be setting examples so that they're actually able to be read by people without blowing them up on the computer. David? What you're saying is on the screen you're unable to see it, but as officers we're able to, to zoom in and see exactly what's going on. It's one of these things that doesn't translate well onto a PowerPoint presentation, but from an officer's perspective, well, Beth can answer for herself, but I'm fairly sure it's easy enough to read. Yes, very much so. Sorry, I, I maybe phrased that wrongly. It was for the purposes of the presentation. I felt it wasn't very easy to read. I have the, the obviously the plans and I can see exactly what the changes were. Yes. Thanks, Andy. Jane Maitland? Well, in the spirit of conciliation and, uh, and help, I wondered if we should all go on a site visit, Member. Great. <laughs> Try and make it after lunch then, Jane. Eh? Uh, John Young? You're not going to ask for a site visit. No, I'm not. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Once the property is modernised, shall we say, is there full disabled access to all parts of it? A, that would be uh, dealt with under the building, <coughs> building regulation side of things with building warrants as opposed to ourselves. I'll get David to try and help me as well, John. The, the difficulty is that you have an existing listed building, so to make it fully DDA compliant is going to be very difficult. That uh, Obviously, in terms of the building warrant side of things, they'll make sure it is as accessible as is possible. If I remember correctly, and it's nothing to do with today, but we had an audit carried out every build known by the Freeson and Galloway Council, a cost of the amendments and modifications required to become DDA compliant, and there was some legislative process that allowed us not to carry out work if it would bankrupt the council in doing so. We were supposed to plan and, and over a period of time develop all buildings to make them accessible, but there was no requirement to do it on a specific date and time. I think that that will still be the case. But anyway, sorry about that distraction. Other questions for case officer? None? Okay, we go to session members. Are we content with the application? Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Hey, we come to agenda item number 11. Oh, well, sorry, Lucy, just confirm the decision, please. And in relation to item 10, members have agreed go with the recommendations as per the report and improve the application unconditionally. Thank you, Lucy. Agenda item 11 eh, for noting. Members happy to note the decision there of the reporter. And agenda item 12, you'll see there are two decisions there by the reporter. Happy to note both decisions. Okay, thank you very much for attending us today, members. I have no other business. Thanks very much.